Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. I have an interesting tear down and repair video for you guys today. I came across an HP synthesizer that, from the dumpster dive, that seems to be broken. So, it's actually very heavy. I have one of these in my lab already. This is an, um, what was it, an HP 8648C model. It's a uh, 100 kHz to 3200 megahertz uh, synthesizer. And uh, they're very useful, and, you know, for all kinds of applications. You can do modulations with them and so on. But this one was from a dumpster dive and uh, supposedly is broken. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to power it on. I'm going to look at the symptoms and see what's wrong with it and then see if we can fix it. But not always these things cannot always be repaired. So I'm not sure if that's possible, but uh, it's worth a try. So we'll go through it together. And if we can fix it, then we'll test it to see um, if it functions according to what its specifications are. So let's get started. So here's the unit a little bit uh, closer. Uh, you can see the front. I think I've used um, my own version of this uh, in one of my older videos um, that you might have seen before, but this is, this is not the same one, but it's exactly the same model. So that in that sense, it's, um, it's nice to try to, try to repair this one because if I find something that doesn't work, I have a reference uh, synthesizer that I can open and I'll have a direct comparison with this one. So it should making repairing this very easy if you have a functional unit that's essentially identical. But before I start taking mine apart, uh, let's take this one apart and see uh, see what happens. And I'm going to plug it in and figure out what's wrong with it. But you know, sometimes you have to open things up before you power them on. But don't take my advice on that. Okay, so I took all the all the screws at the back. There were quite a bit of them. Uh, yeah, I put them in here. And uh, you can see there's actually some damage to this side of the casing, most likely maybe from when it was thrown out or, or before. But uh, I hope that inside everything is, is okay. So this should just slide off. Let's take it out. Here we go. What's happening? Get this thing out. There it is. That is uh, just the case. So I think you can see the, the damage uh, that was done to it. All right. So usually the synthesizers have uh, another cover inside that is helping with the shielding of all the RF sensitive components. So that's sitting under here, but as it is customary with HP equipment, uh, they do a very nice job of actually you know, pointing out what is what. Uh, for example, there's two screws here that they're pointing to saying that these are power supply screws that you shouldn't remove if you want to just remove this case. And apparently underneath this, uh, there should be three boards. One of them is the RF output board, there's a signal uh, uh, generator synthesizer board and a reference board, which must be the, the crystal reference for the, for the whole thing. But you can see that there's an opening. Let me get the camera off the tripod. There we go. You can see there is an opening here where you know, several cables come through. There's, there's this cable here, which I think is connected to, yep, yeah, it's connected to this guy. And uh, there's this guy, which goes directly to the output. So this must be the output of the, the main output coax. So this is a rigid uh, SMA cable, basically. And there is uh, this flexible ribbon, which I think must be for the LCD. Or no, I'm sorry, it's for the uh, the, the keypad. And there is a uh, you know some ribbon cables, which must probably program everything else. And you can see the power switch at the bottom, which I can turn on and off. So uh, let me put this back. And um, first turn it on before I completely take it apart, just in case there's a major problem, uh, at least there is uh, some shielding here before, before I, I completely open it. All right, here's the power signal. Let me plug it in, like so. So everything seems okay so far. And uh, let me try and power it on. Let's see what happens. Oh, nothing, but it's making a horrible, horrible noise. I don't know if you can hear this. Oh, it's very annoying. But the sound is very familiar to me. This is a sound of a switching power supply that's failed. Oh God, it's very annoying. So let me turn it back off. So it seems like the, the switching power supply has some issues, um, but that sound, the high frequency noise is typically from that. So let me uh, unplug it and open the top and see what's going on on the inside. All right, I took all the screws off. And here we go. This comes right up and voila. So just like um, it was written on the front cover, you can see there are three boards in here. 
this is the, yeah, you can see through here, I'm casting some shadows. So this is an output board, this is a synthesizer board, and this is the reference board, these three. And, um, you know, they're, they're sitting there, I know what this is. This is a, a switchable attenuator, so this must be used to achieve very low output powers. Uh, there is an electronic attenuator and an ALC unit on here, I believe. Uh, and some, you know, some caps and so on, some nice cables here. And, of course, there is the switching power supply sitting against uh, this board. So, let me do one thing. So, first thing I'm going to do is, I think I saw a cable that goes from the switching power supply directly to the main board. Let's get some better lighting in here, if I can. Let's focus in here. So there's the there's the switching power supply right there. Uh, so I've unplugged it of course, so you gotta be very careful. So this is the, the this power supply seems like it is its own module and I don't think it's actually made by HP. It's just, uh, I don't know what brand it is, I have to see if I can take it out. But uh, you, you can see from here that this cable goes directly to to the motherboard, uh, which is the, the main motherboard of the of the synthesizer. And then there is the line, the main line that goes to the air. So one thing I can do is that I can disconnect the power supply from the main motherboard and plug it in and power it on again. This will tell me if there is maybe a short circuit or some problem with the motherboard that's loading the switching power supply and preventing it from um, achieving proper operation. So I'm going to disconnect that by pulling this GBC arrow. There you go, that came off actually rather easy. There it is. So now there should be, if I'm not mistaken, no connection between the power supply to the rest of the unit. So the power supply is now completely standalone. So let's plug it in. Let's see if I can find the right orientation. Okay, here we go. So careful now because this inside is some of the wires may be live. I'm turning it on. Oh no, still making the noise. Huh. Well this actually is good news. Because this means that whatever is wrong is probably wrong with the power supply. Or it could be that the motherboard shorted and actually damaged the power supply so they're, they're both bad. But the only way to find out is to take this power supply out and take a closer look at it. Like I said before, I do have a working unit already. Here's my other unit. This is uh, the function of one we've used in part of the previous experiment. So it's exactly the same as the one that I'm opening right now. Um, this, is a, this is a unit that you know was very popular. There are many of them around, and they're very old. So this explains why you know why it was thrown out. All right. So let me find a couple of screws. It looks like the two screws up here are for the power supply. Disconnect the power. Gee, this is such tight screws. Here we go. Okay. Oh, there seems to be some more screws back there, but I should also disconnect it from the main. Well, oh, there, there it is. That comes out. So now the power supply is unconnected completely, but it's still not going to come out because it still has more screws. I need a longer desk. There's not enough room to work. Okay, here we go. It seems like there's only four screws, so please bear with me. I'm very curious to see what is wrong with this. Well, it doesn't smell that bad. It doesn't smell like it's gone in smoke. It does smell a little bit burnt, but... Okay, well, we can't get this screw out. Okay. Oh, the power supply is loose. Put my all the screws that I took in here. Okay, let's see now. Aha! There we go. Whoa, it's actually really hot. Wow, that burnt my hand. So it was very hot. This resistor was quite warm. Looks like a 5 ohm resistor, 5 ohm power resistor. Oh, sorry, it's a 5 watt resistor. 3K? Interesting. I wonder what they're using that for. Okay, so here is the power supply module. So since this is making the noise on its own, I am going to try and find a way to power it on 
without the rest of the unit. So for now, we don't really need to look at the rest of the unit. But regardless, I'm going to take some of the other parts and some other things apart so we can take a look at it and see what is what is inside and how it's built. But there's also one other board here. You cannot be pro didn't didn't point it out last time, but this board here that looks like it's part of the body. This is actually the output RF board because this cable comes from there. Oh, I don't think I'm pointing there. So this 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 SMA cable comes from the output board, goes through the attenuator, through the electronic attenuator and ALC unit, then goes through here and then to the output. So this is how it achieves uh, various uh, levels. This this unit, at least my other unit, can down go down to minus 70 dBm, and that can only really be achieved with um, electronic attenuators. You, you don't want to do that electronically. Uh, mechanical attenuators give you much better ac accuracy and persistent consistency and linearity. So, and yeah, we can take a look at it afterwards. So let me see what I can find to power the the power supply. Uh, directly connected to the line. Got to be a bit careful, and uh, I'll be right back. So while I was looking for a wire to connect this up uh, to the main line, I noticed something. I noticed that there is what seems to be a cap, which should be here. Usually there's a large a mains rated cap here that is missing. Uh, but you can see that there is the, uh, the, the, the silicone glue kind of uh, gunk here around it and um, even here on this heat sink. So it must have been there at some point because the, well, the, the residue of it is here, but it seems like someone has removed it for whatever reason. But I don't believe that this power supply can work without this capacitor. This is a, a very important input uh, capacitor that requires to be there near the bridge, which is right here. Uh, but, you know, if in terms of other things, the construction is nice. Um, single layer PCB, very uh, neatly put together. You can see a very nice, nice uh, round uh, kind of a semi rectangular kind of shape which is the heat sink and this is these are the screws where it connects to the body so even dissipates heat further by being in contact with the metallic body of the unit uh, the nice big uh, transformer here made by computer products uh, power conversion made in Hong Kong and uh, you can see uh, there's a lot of that silicon glue here holding these other capacitors together and this is of course very important because you know, these guys uh, cannot vibrate too much and they can actually come loose. Uh, there is the, the fuse, the main rated caps, and this one seems like it's wrapped in uh, some kind of a tape, like electric tape. Uh, there's a main rated capacitor. They input some all kind of protection, uh, some more input protection that is actually shrink tubed further, and this uh, resistor here that burnt me when I took it out, it was quite hot. There's another regulator here with a Heat sink. I mean, the construction is. I'm sure you've seen tons of these switching power supplies. It's also interesting. Uh, an inductor that's sitting on this custom uh, package. Uh, it's also glued down fairly well. So, you know, it looks good. Everything looks good. But the capacitor is not here, and I really don't think that it would work without it. Um, so I guess I'm going to remove the remove this guy. Uh, from the metallic case that's at the bottom to see if anyone uh, if, if anyone has unsoldered this because at least you would be able to tell if someone has kind of pl played around with it to remove this part. So um, let me try that. I don't understand why somebody would do that. Maybe uh, one possibility is that uh, this was broken, they opened it up and they couldn't figure out how to fix it and they needed the capacitor to remove it. but. But then why would they put it back together again? Uh, that wouldn't make any sense. So that's again unusual. Oh my god, these are tight. Let me go and one more. So we should be able to now see the the bottom of this board. There we go. Oh, this is interesting. So they have this uh, this plastic stands here, and they've put two of them here to push against the bottom of the PCB so that the bottom doesn't, if the board bends for whatever reason, it doesn't come in contact with the with this aluminum plate. So instead of having another metal standoff here and here, they've just done these. Uh, interesting, I guess it's cheaper. 
Here we go. So let's take a look. Huh? Look at that. This is not. This is not the sign of it being on someone soldering it off. This looks like it's uh, just been pulled out. That's weird. Maybe that's why it doesn't work. But why would anybody do that? Um, that's weird. Let me see if I have a cap that uh, would fit roughly the size. So I just found out something really funny in a way. Well, we were looking inside this, but I didn't notice. Now, <laughs> if you look here, this is an unlikely set of events. Look at that. Do you see it? There is a capacitor here that's just sitting here. It's wedged underneath this, and I didn't notice, so it wasn't bouncing around the unit. I've been turning this around all the time, but it made no noises to tell me that there was something that might have been loose inside it. But this capacitor is just sitting here, wedged inside. Ah, it's really stuck. There it is. <laughs> there is the missing cap. And uh, it's just sitting inside the unit. It doesn't look like it's damaged anything. Um, but it was definitely wedged in there. That's, that, is, that is crazy. I've, I've never seen this before. I mean, it, 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 if it was loose, I would have known right away. But it was wedged in there. You can see that the pins are still okay. It is a, a Nishikan capacitor, right? A rate of 105 degrees Celsius rate, very nice. And uh, it's, uh, let me see, it doesn't say anything else. It's 470 microfarad and 450 volt rated, of course, because it's on the, on the line and this thing should supposed to work up to 220, no problem. So, but I'm, I'm kind of feeling it a little bit to see if it has any dents or, oh yeah, it does. It does have a dent here. I don't know if you can see on the camera, but it is definitely not perfect cylinder. So this must have happened because it came off. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's bloated. Sometimes these things pop off because they explode. But it, otherwise, I mean, it looks good. I'm going to measure it uh, with the um, LR, LCR meter. But you know what? Okay, now I put everything together. Remember how the outer case was damaged? This thing must have fallen off onto the ground. The whole unit must have been dropped uh, from a table or from someone who was carrying it. And when it hit the ground, the capacitor must have popped off the power supply and got lodged inside the unit. So this is supposed, and you can see that there used to be, in fact, that the glue that they put on, the silicone that they put on, wasn't sufficient to hold the capacitor in place. So this is a, a perfect example of why this is so important. Uh, because it fell, it, it, this is so heavy, as, uh, so the inertia just ripped it out of the board. And I think this must be the, the cause why this whole thing has failed. And it'd be amazing if I put this back and the whole thing works. But I'm going to first measure this to make sure this is okay. But uh, that's it. I mean, you can see you know, it fits here perfectly. This is where it used to be. And, and uh, whoever uh, you know, did put this silicone did, just didn't put enough. And uh, so let there be a lesson uh, that this is very important. You can lose your product like this and end up in the trash because of a problem like this. And uh, the fact that this wasn't loose and banging around, that's just weird. But aside from that, this must be the problem. So I'm going to, let's go over to the, uh, to the LCR meter and we will measure it to see. And it's 470 microfarads, so my LCR meter should have no problem measuring it. Uh, or the Regal um, multimeter, they should be both, they should work fine. Okay, uh, I've moved to the other side of the lab, turn the turn on Regal supply on. It should, it should be just fine for measuring this. There's no reason to uh, to you know to invoke the LCR meter. I, I ha don't have the uh, the connectors. I have to uh, get the cable out. So this uh, just makes it a little bit easier to measure. So I'm going to use uh, these cables, short, nice and short, and one of these uh, banana to BNC converters. Plug this into here, which I believe is fine for measuring caps. Yes. Select the capacitor, and uh, this is just reading. Nothing right now, so let's connect it up. Negative to negative. So this is 470 microfarad. Let's see. Okay, it's auto ranging, still auto ranging microfarads. And come on, you can do it. There it is 0.45 millifarad, which is 
It should be 470, but it's fine. Uh, I mean, this does have a little bit of a dent, but uh, maybe I should measure uh, using the LCR meter just to make sure that it doesn't have a, a bad loss property. Uh, but anyhow, um, it's fine. I, I have to look for the cable. But here it is. It seems like it's okay. I mean, 400 and, uh, you know, 450 uh, millifarad is, uh, is pretty good. And it should do. But I want, unfortunately, I don't have a replacement. Uh, otherwise, I would, uh, I would just do that. So let's see. Let's uh, go through putting it back on the power supply. Okay, here's our power supply, capacitor, some soldering stuff, and my trusted Weller soldering iron, which I've had for probably more than 15 years now, or 14 years now. And it's been working perfectly. I'm going to try and uh, put this back. Uh, let me see if I can put this back in there. I still can't believe this has popped out and uh, still is in one piece. There we go, is a, another piece of this silicone stuff. In the trash you go. And let me see if this will even fit back in here. Oh, well, it looks like it does. Ah, there we go, it's actually a nice and snug fit. So now what I need to do is to really hard and remelt these traces and make sure let me put something on this side to even this out a little bit. There we go. Remelt the traces in order to apply some of this flux. Hopefully by remelting it and adding a bit of solder to it, I should be able to make a nice contact. Oh, it's a bit of an awkward angle here. Get some more solder. There we go. Nice connection. And the second one. Perfect. I think I think this is good. Oop, too much. Let me see if we can focus on it. There we go. Looks uh, looks pretty good. Looks like it's made a nice contact, and there isn't even so much uh, solder residue. But just in case, I will clean that up anyway. Not. So I have, I have a little bit of methanol left here. I'm going to use there we go. It's very good for this type of work. Look at that. Perfect. The solder joints look really good. Can't even tell that this had happened. Amazing. There you go. This is what it should have looked like. I should have noticed as soon as I opened it that it was missing a big capacitor, but there you go. Now, now we know. So now I'm going to take the glue gun. I'm going to put a bunch of glue on it, not to make the same mistake. Make sure it's uh, nice and tight and uh, we will plug it back in for the exciting moment. So while I'm waiting for the heat gun to heat up. I was looking at the uh, different things on this board and uh, if you look at uh, the, the four places the screws are held, only one of them is actually on the PCB traces. And if you trace this out uh, on this side, trace it on this side, there's a cap there, main rated cap, and it actually goes to the earth ground uh, pin that goes to the power supply and then that continues on, that trace continues on and it meets several other components. First of all this Again, this is earth ground, which makes sense because this is connected to the body also. And then it uh, continues on this way and goes to these protection uh, circuits here. So they do have some protection circuits on the, on the, on the earth ground, which is rather good. And uh, two, two different transformers which we looked at. And I, I'm trying to figure out exactly what, what they're doing with this guy, but uh, it looks like it's just uh, the load. For some reason, they have added this. I have to through it to figure it out but 
I'm excited to plug it back in and power it on. And yeah, this whole thing is manufactured by Computer Products Incorporated. I don't know if they're still in business or not. I don't know anything about them. Other than that, though, there's this, these inductors, these vertical inductors are all being taped up uh, to make sure that they don't short, but they're loose, you know. Um, they're not kind of these, for example, there's glue on this one, silicon glue on this one, but there's nothing on this one. So, and yeah, I don't plan to throw this around, but maybe I'll add a little bit of extra glue to some of these places that doesn't have it. Um, to just to be on the on the safe side. So I don't think me gluing this is very exciting. So I'll show you to you when it's done. So I thought while we're waiting for this, I'll give you another quick look on these screwdrivers. I'm I'm really happy with these guys. Uh, they actually this this stand uh, I made uh, myself using a piece of uh, um, um, plexiglass um, and four stands on it. So I can put the screws in there, the screwdrivers in there. If you buy a pack of these, the We Are Screwdrivers, it comes with a stand, but it doesn't have enough holes. I had more screwdrivers, so I had to I had to make one, and they're all sorted by type. And um, you know, I'm again the, the tips are very nice. For example, if you look at the smallest, um, this is a Torx screwdriver, the smallest one. They all have um, a strengthened steel tips, so they should last for a long time. Regardless, they they have warranty anyway. If you happen to, to damage any of them. But uh, you know, if you want to know more about these, uh, I'd be happy to maybe do a little quick review on these guys. Very happy with them and I think they are going to last for a very long time. And here's the finished product. I just put a whole bunch of this uh, glue gun glue uh, on there and I put it on some of the components that didn't have as much just to make sure. So now the exciting procedure of uh, putting this guy back inside the whole unit. Okay, the power supply is inside. I've plugged it in. So let's turn it on and see if it works. There we go. Where is this switch? There it is. And... Aha! Uh -huh. Perfect. Oh, it's doing self-test. Any errors? No, doesn't seem like they had any errors. 1000 megahertz. The FM modulation frequency is 10 kilohertz and the output is set to 0 dBm and the output is turned off. I should be able to turn it on with this button. No, it doesn't, doesn't give me an ALC error, it doesn't say that its output amplitude is on level. So that's a good thing, but we have to of course test it to see if it works, but it at least now powers on. So the easiest way to verify the performance of the signal generator is to measure the output power as a function of frequency and to see if it is actually putting out the power that it is saying it is. And then we can look at the harmonics on the spectrum analyzer, but there's nothing like a power meter that can give you exact accurate uh, measurements. So I have, I have two power meters here, an older HP one and a newer Agile one. Uh, so we can try and measure the power with a newer unit to see uh, if it matches what is displayed. So for that I'm going to use this particular power meter which already has a power sensor which already has a type N connector which is nice because it matches the type N connector on the source and of course the type N connector on the calibration port of the power meter as well. And this particular guy, this is model 8481 uh, from HP even though it's an older build it is really it hasn't been used very often so it should be very good condition. And it does work uh, anywhere from 0.1 gigahertz all the way to 18 gigahertz but we're only going to go to 3.2 gigahertz here and the calibration factor is very close to 100 so I'm not going to bother entering that into the power meter I'm just going to assume it's fairly close we just want to see if it's working so to do that I will uh, power this guy up and we can use port A and so it says that there is nothing connected. I don't know if this shows up on the on the camera here. So it says nothing's connected. So I will connect this guy up to the power meter and it should show up. There it is. It's saying minus 22 dBm. It hasn't been zeroed or calibrated. So I have to do that first. First let me untangle this cable. There we go. So first thing first. I don't know why it, I don't this shouldn't this light should not be on for some reason the output power is enabled let's find out why frequency calibration that's fine 
zero to to off. Okay, I don't know why that was turned on. That should only be turned on during the actual calibration of the power sensor unit itself. So basically what how this power sensor works is that this is an, a thermal device. So there is a, a diode in there which is, acts like a load and depending on how much power it's absorbed into the diode the temperature of that component rises and there is an amplifier in there and an A2D in there that converts that into a digital signal which is read by this but depending on the ambient temperature and all the other effects that there are uh, you can have a you you would have to calibrate and zero this in order to be able to read an accurate measurement. So when you connect one of these guys, you have to go under calibration and zero, which you can see here. It says zero. You probably can see it. So first you zero it. That way it knows what the lowest absolute lowest limit is. So it will go to the lowest measurement accuracy, the noise floor essentially of the sensor. And for this unit, I think it's about minus 35 dBm or so minus 20, minus 47. So you can see it was saying minus 22 before, now it says minus 49. This is a noise floor. And then we can calibrate it, we calibrate A, then it puts a known output power. Now the light is on again. It puts exactly 0 dBm and it calibrates the power sensor. So it knows what 0 dBm is. So if I go and turn the power reference back on, you can see here, the light is turned on, now it says 0. So it's perfectly calibrated. That's our zero reference level. So turn it off. Now I can go ahead and disconnect this guy again from the unit like so. Now we're ready to measure power. So let's turn this guy on. It's very loud. I will connect this to the output of our source now. There we go. These type N connectors are always a little bit difficult to connect. There. So now we should be, be ready to measure some power. So let's start with something simple. Let's start with measuring the power at 500 megahertz. So frequency 500 megahertz. The power 0 dBm straightforward. I'm going to go here and I'm going to enable the alpha power. And let's see how off it is and enable. There we go. That's pretty good. It's only off by, you know, maybe uh, 10 milli dBm, which is very little. So let's try. I'm going to change the frequency to see if it is consistently stays at 0 dBm. We should have no losses because we have no cable between the two ports. So the measurement plane is at directly at the output connector of the source and directly at the input connector of the power meter. This is the advantage of using this aside from accuracy than connecting a cable to the spectrum analyzer because that cable is going to have frequency dependent loss but we don't have frequency dependent losses here because we are basically at the measurement plane where we calibrated so it should be perfect. So let's change the frequency and plus I didn't even let this unit warm up maybe it'll even go down to becoming better but anyhow. So 500 megahertz I'm going to try a thousand megahertz and 1000 megahertz, there it is. So now it's a little bit less power. Now 1500 megahertz. Okay, a little bit less. 2000, didn't change. 2500, okay, it's now becoming a little bit lower than it should be. Now it's off by 0.15 dBm. That, that would start to being uh, problematic in some applications. 3000 dBm, minus 0 0.39, 0 0.4 dBm off now. Although there is one thing we should consider that I did not enter the calibration factor of the power sensor. So there is a little bit of that because of that too, which I'm ignoring here. The calibration factor here is set to 100%. So in reality it's 90 something percent. And uh, 3500, well actually what is the highest? Highest frequency 3200. So I can enter 3200 megahertz, the highest frequency you can go, and now it's actually over the power. So it's not putting out too much power. It seems very reasonable, so let's go to the middle of the range, let's say 1500 or 1600 megahertz. So 1.6 gigahertz, that's the power I guess. Now let's try and adjust the output power. Right now, the output power we have set is 0 dBm. 
right here. So I'm going to change it to less, the highest it can go is 21 dBm and the lowest it can go is a minus 136 dBm. So it has a huge dynamic range, again because it has a mechanical uh, 70 dB attenuator inside which I showed you before. So let's try some different output powers. Let's go 10 dBm. Oops, that's the wrong uh, amplitude. 10 dBm. There it is. Ah, now we go back here. It is. That's <laughs> it's basically 10 dBm. It's very good. Let's try um, 20 dBm. I have to make sure I don't damage this. Well, you can take that. You can take that much, no problem. So 20 dBm. It is 19.51, and I believe 21 dBm is the highest it can go to. And power uh, amplitude. Yep, 21 dBm is the highest it can go. So it actually doesn't really do 21 dBm because at 20 dBm it's doing 19.52. Now I'm at 19 dBm, it's doing 18.72. So it's beginning to saturate already. 18 doing 17.86. So 21, it cannot do 21, but it is doing. The maximum it does is 19.77 at 1600. So let's go to the other side. Let me try minus 10 dBm. There it is, minus 10 dBm, no problem. You can hear the attenuators click. Minus 20 dBm, again, very good. Minus 30 dBm is now a little bit off. That is because I'm at the noise floor of the instrument. So you have to wait actually for the you can see it's cooling down. When you're at very low output power, the power sensor needs time to settle, needs to cool back down. So if I go all the way to, you know, let's say 2 dBm and I go very quickly back, minus 29, 30, it takes a little bit of time for it to get there. So I cannot really measure lower than minus 40 using the power sensor because my power, me power sensor doesn't go below that value. So it seems to be fine. Let me try let me set it to 21 dBm. Now it's set to 21 dBm. Now I can change the frequency and see if it can give me that much across the frequency band. So let's start at uh, 500 megahertz. Oops. I think I just over went over the value of my power sensor. Yep, I guess it can do 21 dBm and the power sensor can only read 20 dBm so it gives me a warning of 999 but so anyhow 2500 megahertz it's doing 16 so it's actually not able to keep up to the 21 uh, dBm that it used to be able to do before so let me try going back to 1600 there it is that's what it used to read before so it seems like if I go lower than 1600 There it is, that's 1500, 1400, yeah, so at around 1500 it can do 21 dBm. But then, yeah, so now I'm at 1200 and that's it, it cannot do. So 21 dBm is actually the maximum that this power sensor can show. So 12, 1200 dBm, uh, 1200 megahertz, I get uh, 20 and I go higher. Now I'm at 22 gigahertz, it's already 17, 25, 16. 30, 15, and 32, 14.45. So the display is showing 21 dBm, but it's not able to actually do 21 dBm. Now, now see I'm set to 17, 16, 15, it makes no difference. And now that I hit 14 or 13 dBm, it's beginning to actually become accurate again. Now I'm at 10 dBm. So this is, this is again normal because not all the output range and all the frequencies are going to work on, on uh, synthesizers. This is a normal thing, but usually synthesizers show, the more modern synthesizers show that the output amplitude that you're setting hasn't been reached. So here, if I increase to 21 dBm, it says the knob is out of range, but it doesn't tell me anything here that it's not achieving 21 dBm. Even though it's set to 21 dBm here, it's actually only putting down 14 dBm. This is not, a, this is not necessarily a failure. This is normal. But all modern synthesizers tell you that you haven't reached this. It says the output is on level, but this one doesn't do that. Well, that is normal. So let's go back to, a, let's say, a frequency of 500. Ah, I hate the interface on this. 500 megahertz, an amplitude of 0 dBm. There it is, which, of course, we're getting. But now we can connect it to 
we can use a cable and connect the whole thing to the Regal Spectrum Analyzer so we can see the harmonics. And once we see the harmonics are also reasonably okay, then we know that the unit is functional and I can then maybe take it apart a little bit more to see, to show you some of the other components. Okay, so I've connected the, the instrument now to the Regal uh, spectrum analyzer so now we can actually see the harmonics not just the total power um, and we can see if, the, if it's acceptable so I've set the unit to to be at 500 megahertz with 0 dBm of alpha power the output is turned off now and by doing so I would be able to since the spectrum analyzer goes up to 3 gigahertz and this is at 500 megahertz I will be able to see six harmonics basically almost six harmonics five harmonics that way I can see um, if there's any problems with it generating uh, any tones that we don't want to. If I set it to, let's say, 3 gigahertz, we will not see any of the harmonics because it will be outside the, the measurement range of the spectrum analyzer. So at uh, 500 megahertz, I will enable the output power. There it is. And uh, it's putting out 0 dBm. So let me change the level here. So I'm going to set the reference level to 10 dBm. There it is. And Press escape. I can reduce the resolution bandwidth a little bit. You can get a better idea. And I think it looks pretty good. I go to peak. There it is. So the peak value 0 0.22 dBm. Again, that's normal. There's some loss in the in the cable that I'm using, this green cable that comes from here all the way to here. So there's some loss in the cable, of course, and also the fact that the accuracy of the spectrum analyzer. Uh, is not nearly as good as the accuracy of the power meter. So there is some discrepancy, but it makes sense that there is a, there is a little bit of a difference. So there, I, what I will do now is I will uh, look at the difference between that marker and that marker to give an idea of the total harmonic distortion that this unit is producing. So I will go to my marker, I will click on delta, and I will go to the right peak, and it, there it is, it easily does it for me. So the difference between this peak and this peak there's a little bit there too, but that's much smaller already. So it's, we have about 42 dB of total harmonic distortion coming out at 0 dBm. I can increase the amplitude to, let's say, 10 dBm. And you can see the total harmonic distortion gets significantly worse. But that's normal. This, is, this does happen to... Uh, all signal sources. I don't remember exactly the specification of this particular one, but you know, if you produce lower amplitude, it gets better. So that's to be expected. I don't know if it's uh, within spec or not, but looks pretty good to me based on my experience looking at some other ones. So it seems like it's fine. Let me try a different frequency. Let me go back to 0 dBm. There it is, our 0 dBm. Let me go instead of 500 megahertz, let me go to 1 gigahertz. So let's say frequency 1000 megahertz. Again, it seems like it has similar performance. Here's one gigahertz and here's the harmonic. So pretty good. Pretty happy with it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, since it's already fallen off the table and, you know, has probably received a major bang and it's still in spec or close to it at least, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe, since I promised to show you some of the internals, let's take some of those cards out and open them up and, and see what it looks like. So I took one of these boards out. This is the middle one. I thought it would be the most interesting one. This is a signal uh, generated synthesizer board. Uh, this is the reference board, and this is so this is the output board. This is the reference board. And uh, if you look again in here, there's a board in here that that holds the firmware. So when you want to change the firmware, to this there's a screw at the back that this plate comes off, and you just pop this out and put the new firmware in. But I went ahead and I took this out, which looked like this. Uh, like so, and I took all the, the screws off on one side and the screws off on the other side and it says uh, component side here actually, so it, that's where the components go and I pull it out with quite a bit of difficulty and it looks really really nice, um, I mean HP engineers uh, really know what they're doing, so let me set the camera up right here so you can take a look at this so this board has uh, uh, essentially it's almost completely surface mount. Um, it has some through hole, through hole stuff, but the layout is is beautiful. The soldering is top notch. It's got all kind of uh, uh, tantalum capacitors and uh, all kind of passives. Some through holes, some resistors, some uh, some resistors here, some trim pots here, which I'm not going to 
playing around with. But since this is a synthesizer board, this must be uh, the core synthesizer, the VCO, and uh, where all the say EF, EM sensitive components are held. It actually has four screws. I'm really tempted to open it and, and take a look and see what it, is, what it looks like. I kind of have an idea what it would be like inside this, but I do want to see it. And I, it has a whole bunch of these twin caps at the back, so it's very nice surface mount components all the way at the back. And a lot of uh, attention to detail. I don't see any mistakes on it where they have tried to kind of patch it and fix it, but I'm trying to find out where the out. So if you look here, carefully, let me get something to point with. I have to figure out a better way for the lighting in, in this room. So you can see this is the output here. It goes into an RF transistor and it goes back through here through some passives, goes through here another um, uh, RF transistor here through some more passives for matching and it comes out of here. So this is a synthesizer, but this is not this is not the board that goes all the way up to three gigahertz. This is just a synthesizer board. The output of this board, which is at much lower frequency, might be at 312 megahertz or, or even lower than that. I have to look at the data sheet to find out exactly how the signal path on this is followed. And then it goes comes out of here, it goes into the motherboard, and from there it goes to the output board, which then it gets multiplied and filtered and mixed with itself in order to create every possible frequency from, um, uh, I guess this starts at 100 kilohertz to 3.2 gigahertz. But this is really the main synthesizer where the performance, the phase noise and so on, is determined by this block. Um, so maybe I'll try and open it and see what it looks like on the inside. Here it is. So I took the screws off and this pops right out. Oh, I see. And there is a there is a uh, an RF absorber here which sits right on the other side of this board and absorbs any kind of um, EM radiation that might be coming out from here. I'm thinking this is just a VCO. So there is uh, also another metallic washer of which provides, uh, it looks like it might be even gold plated, which creates a very nice contact between the top uh, cap that you saw on the board and also creates some, some kind of a, a, a pressure in there. So if you look here, what I suspect this to be, these four diodes connector, are the varactor of the VCO. And just as I was saying that there are no botch jobs and there's no fixes, there's a little wire inside here that they must have fixed, but that seems to be the only one on this board. But this also comes off on the other side, so I would suspect to see at least a transistor where those varactors are connected to, which basically makes up the core of the VCO. So there we go. Oh, look at that. It's uh, all molded and a uh, nice area compartment and everything to, to create uh, all kind of uh, blocks. It's really, really thick walls. Look at the, how, how thick these walls actually are to prevent any signal penetration. And here it is. So let me see. Yeah, there it is. There is a little transistor there, which is connected to these four reactors. So that's our VCO. And uh, I, I'm, at least I think that's the VCO. And the output is taken from this side and goes into here. And um, sorry, it's taken from here, which goes through this amplifier and, and so on. So it, it seems like, and you can see they've, they've cut the board out on all four corners to really isolate everything. So the edges of this container go through these gaps and really isolate and shield the VCO from any external influence. This is as good as it's going to get, really. And even when you make an ASIC design, if you were to make a VCO in an integrated circuit, which is some of the stuff that I work on, you have to do this even on the chip. You will create a Faraday cage and you put all your circuits inside it that are very sensitive. So synthesizers and PLLs and so on have to be very have to follow these rules. It doesn't matter if it's on a PCB or on a on a so here I have the block diagram of the synthesizer in front of me and we can walk through the operation of the synthesizer by following the signals from one component to the other. Now, if you remember, there were three main boards that I showed on the video and then there was one output board, which was the long metallic one at the edge of the instrument. So we're going to see the functionality of each of those and see what they do. I remember, if you remember again, there were three main boards. So there's the reference board, there's the signal synthesizer board, and then there was an output board. And there is another board, of course, the, the metallic one, which I will show later. So if you remember, I opened the signal synthesizer board, and I mentioned that there's a VCO in there, and there's the VCO right here. And the signal synthesizer board uses the VCO to generate a range of frequencies in a PLL, in a phase-like loop architecture. But let's look at the overall 
and see how this how this whole instrument works. So we have a 10 megahertz reference, which is inside the reference board, or you could take the 10 megahertz reference from outside. All synthesizers accept the 10 megahertz reference from outside the instrument to be able to lock them to other synthesizers. So the main reference board takes the 10 megahertz si signal and it has its own VCO and PLL in here. This is a this is a PLL architecture. And maybe I'll do a video about PLL behavior and we can make maybe build a PLL ourselves and see how it works. But for now, the phase like loop inside the reference board is used, it uses a 10 megahertz as the reference input and it generates a single 1000 megahertz, one gigahertz band LO. So, the, so in order to get a, a bird's eye view of how this whole synthesizer works, it's based on a super heterodyne architecture where it produces only a small band of frequencies and a constant LO frequency and then it mixes those together to get all the other frequencies and then it continues to double them and filter them and double them again in order to get anywhere from 100 kilohertz to 3.2 gigahertz. So we can walk through that. Here's our LO frequency, 1000 megahertz, produced by the reference board. And our synthesizer board that I open has a more uh, it has an adjustable frequency, which goes from 498 to 1,002 megahertz, and it can be divided by two. So it has, it has two bands where it goes from half a gigahertz to a gigahertz, and then you, you can divide this other one to go from basically from DC to 500 megahertz. So it takes those two signals, so it, it produces an adjustable signal in, in those two bands, and an A4 reference gives us a constant signal, and then the two go together to the A6 output board. And in there, there are mixers and modulators where they combine and mix together in order to produce all the frequencies from 100 or from 9 kilohertz to 1000 megahertz. So you can see the constant LO comes in into the main mixer LO and then the RF is, comes from the modulator, the signal synthesizer board that I opened. And since that's adjustable by combining it with the mixer, you can actually now get any frequencies between 9 kilohertz to 249 megahertz, between 500 megahertz and 1000 megahertz, and between 249 and 500 megahertz. There are other components here too, especially on the motherboard, because this instrument can do AM, PM, and FM modulation, which therefore, you know, has to be, of course, added up to the output in order to uh, create all the, you can see, for example, here, the FM modulation is directly fed into the PLL inside the signal synthesizer, but by modulating the charge pump voltage, you can get and FM modulation, of course. So that's all built into the, the motherboard. But the, if you were just thinking about a constant output, we can get it into three bands by mixing the LO and the output from the synthesizer. And you can then, if you are, if you set the front panel to 200 megahertz, and this switch will choose this path. If you're, you know, between, let's say you're at 750 megahertz, you will have this path. And if you're at uh, 600 megahertz, or sorry, if you're at, uh, let's say 400 megahertz, you will choose this path. And that these three, this switch is automatically selected as you select the output frequency. You can see, you know, for example, the divided by two is here. So if you divide it by two, instead of getting 500, you get 249. So it really, really makes sense of how this is done. And the ALC loop and the integrator, which detect the output signal and make sure that everything is uh, has the uh, it detects all, any kind of out of uh, lock or out of power detection, all that stuff is there. Is actually built into the output board. I was mistaken that it is not that component on the outside. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. The other component that was sitting next to the attenuator. So the output out of here is from nine kilohertz to 1000 megahertz, but that doesn't take us to 3.2 gigahertz, which is the output, which is the maximum frequency of this unit. So this now has to, something else needs to happen to this in order for us to get even higher frequencies. And this then follows to another page, but before we go that, and there's really nothing other exciting here is all the digital stuff and the, and the motherboard and the CPU and all the digital lines go around the front panel and the display is all controlled by the motherboard, the components that are on the motherboard. But really, if you're following the RF path, uh, we have to now follow this line here and it goes into another page right here. So now this is this goes from 9 kilohertz to 1000 megahertz. And if you have the H648C model, your maximum output frequency is 3.2 gigahertz, which is this unit. So if you don't need anything higher than 1000, it says if you're less than 1000 megahertz, you just take this path, which is just a straight path to the output. So that, that then therefore the frequency extension board, the, meta, the big metallic board that was at the edge of the instrument does nothing in this case. But if you need more than 1000 megahertz, now you need to double your signal. So it will double it. And since doubling produces harmonics and tones that are undesired, it goes through a bandpass filter, which 
filters depending on the frequency you need. It filters the, the harmonics that you don't want. And then if you need less than 2000 megahertz, you only need to double it once. Then it goes at the output. But if you need even more than 2000 megahertz, you need to double it again. Double once, double again, filter, filter, amplifier, and so on all the way to the output. Now, this point now, therefore, now can cover anywhere from 9 kilohertz to 4, kilo, 4 gigahertz because you can uh, double it twice. Then that output, which says here, this is 4 dB above the front panel setting. So the output that comes out of here is basically uh, the maximum they can produce using the frequency extension board. And then once you reach the maximum, then at that point you can attenuate to get all the less values. Remember, this goes down to minus 136 dBm, which is done by this attenuator. So the attenuator, the mechanical attenuator, is actually from 0 to 130 dB. It's not a 70 dB attenuator like I originally thought. So 130 dB of attenuation can be applied to this signal directly. And finally, it goes through an RPP, which is a reverse power protection. I accidentally thought that that was, I mistakenly thought that that was a, a, an electronic attenuator. It is not. And I thought that was the ALC unit, and it is not. The ALC unit is built into the alpha port. So therefore, the, what this does is that the reverse power protection prevents power from coming back from the front panel into the instrument. So sometimes you connect synthesizers to other synthesizers in order to combine the signal, or maybe you're connecting it to something that accidentally generates a very large signal, which can then damage the frequency extension board or other components. So in order to protect these electronic components, if a power more than a certain amount is detected at the front panel, the RPP automatically disconnects from the front panel, preventing anything from entering through the attenuator into the frequency extension board. So you can see that the, the whole architecture is, I mean, it, it, all synthesizers that I am aware of, they all behave and work in exactly the same way. So even if you go ahead and buy a 70 gigahertz Agilent top of the line synthesizer, it only has a PLL and a gig oscillator between three to six gigahertz, if I'm not mistaken. And then it takes the three to six gigahertz synthesized output and it multiplies them, mixes them, multiplies them, filters them, and that's how it generates all the frequencies from, let's say, 250 kilohertz all the way up to 70 gigahertz. It does it by doing exactly the same thing that we see here, except at a much higher frequency and many, many more multiplication and mixing uh, levels that we see here. But therefore, because we are only synthesizing the signal only once here and once here in the reference board, the phase noise performance of the entire instrument is determined by these blocks. And that's why it was so important to see to shield this component so well, because if any signal, any noise enters through the charge pump line into the PLL or couples into the VCO, that signal will be there throughout all the frequencies because you will multiply it, it will always be there, you cannot get rid of it if you add noise to the VCO charge pump or the VCO output is, is basically you're finished at that point. So the performance is heavily depends on the signals in the generator board and the reference board and of course how the quality of the 10 megahertz reference because you're using that as the reference of your synthesizer. And there are options which you can buy where you get a much better reference and the reason that's that's why that those options are there that if your reference is better your 3.2 gigahertz output is also going to be better because ultimately they're all going to be generated from the 10 megahertz reference and the quality of the VCO and the quality of the signal interactions between these blocks is going to determine the performance of the entire instrument even in the one that's at 70 gigahertz it doesn't matter so like I said before I need to uh, create a, a video about PLLs separately uh, to go into the detail and actually see some of these uh, imperfections when you make a PLL and see how sensitive these uh, instruments can actually be or these circuits can actually be but we, I hope that now you have a fairly good idea about how these synthesizers work. Um, this is how um, everybody builds them. So it's, it's worthwhile to go through these block diagrams to really understand how they work. And you can attempt to make some of these things using discrete components. And uh, for now, um, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you next time.